We've been modeling how people vote by attempting to match their stances on issues with a candidate's stances on issues, and we've found two primary results. First, candidates with the most extreme political leanings tend to win, and second, the population ends up being approximately 50% satisfied with the winner. When you think about it, these results really aren't that surprising. The problem basically boils down to picking random assortments of ones and negative ones and evaluating how well two sets match. On average, they'll have 50% of their values in common unless you swing the odds heavily one way or another. But the swinging of the odds is based on the assumption that all political issues are correlated and that a positive one stance in one issue favors a positive one stance in another. Mathematically, it's a question of what is the average of your values and producing a single number between negative one and one. This is inherently a one-dimensional model. But real life is not that simple. While an individual may have reason to take a stand in favor of mixing orange trees and lemon trees, and a similar reason to take a stand in favor of raising sheep and cows in the same pen, those issues might not necessarily correlate for everyone else. A second voter could be pro-fruit mixing but anti-animal mixing, a third voter could be anti-fruit mixing but pro-animal mixing, and a fourth voter could be against mixing species altogether. Studying this population is inherently a two-dimensional problem. It's tempting to collapse this problem down into a pro-mixing camp and an anti-mixing camp, but doing so potentially ignores two segments of the population contributing to their dissatisfaction with anyone elected in a two-camp system. So in today's code, we're going to assume that some issues are correlated with each other, but not necessarily with others. Doing so will require us to group issues into sets and assign voters and candidates a leaning value for each set. We'll start by defining the number of sets or the number of dimensions of issues that we're considering. Uh, we're going to start out with an indim of one, just to make sure that we can reproduce our results from the previous code. Uh, we also need to now create multiple satisfaction graphs uh, so that we can graph the population satisfaction versus each dimension's leaning. The number of issues that we set is now the number of issues within each dimension. Uh, so in order to keep the total number of issues consistent, we'll need to scale this down with the number of dimensions. The big difference comes down under generating issues, where now we have the leaning argument as a list instead of a single value. So now each voter and each candidate has an array of leaning values. So they have a leaning for issue group one, a leaning for issue group two, a leaning for issue group three, etc. Similarly, now when we define our candidates, we need to provide them with a list of leaning values. We still have our original set from before, so that when we attempt to reproduce our results, we've got Bob at one, Jim at negative one, Tom at zero, Sue at 0.5, Deb at negative 0.5. When we have indim set to one, uh, the code will ignore these other two leaning values because it won't be looping over them. And then the other major change is when we generate the voters, uh, we now have to loop over the dimensions and assign them a leaning value for each one of those dimensions. But the rest of the code proceeds pretty much the same way because we still have a, an issue list for each voter and each candidate. And so we can calculate the match score in the same way that we did before. Uh, again, with the correction that I made at the end of the last video. And so if this is working correctly, we should get the same results that we got last time with one dimension. Um, we should see, like we saw before, Bob and Jim take the uh, take the wins and split them basically in half, while Tom, Sue, and Deb take zero wins. And we should see a population satisfaction of about 50%. Lo and behold, we do. We've got the same type of results as last time. Bob and Jim split in half. Uh, population's about 50% happy with a 1.5% standard deviation. And we've got the X formation for our graph. So now let's test our new model. Let's see what happens when we have a population that doesn't feel the need to correlate all of their issues uh, into two camps. What if they correlated them into, uh, into four possible camps? In other words, if you have two dimensions, you can have a 1-1, one, one, a negative 1-1, one, one, negative 1-1, one, negative one, and 1-1, one, negative one, just like we had on our trees and animals. Um, so in order to keep the total number of issues the same, we'll decrease this to 10. So we've got two dimensions with 10 issues each. So our population has successfully decorrelated half of their issues. 
<clears throat> and since we know that extreme candidates tend to win, let's for now put Sue and Deb back to, or up to an extreme value. So now the main difference is Bob is in the one negative one corner, Jim is in the negative one negative one corner, so these two are still opposite of each other. But now Sue and Deb are, are occupying the off corners of the quadrant. So let's run the code, see what we get. Okay, uh, so now our graph is a little bit messier because we're graphing one of the dimensions as the green dots and one of them as the uh, bluish green dots. But the interesting thing to note is that now our candidates split the wins a little bit better. Um, Bob and Jim, for whatever reason, are still taking a bit more than Sue and Deb. I'm not sure if there's an error in the code or if it's simply that they are coming first or what the deal with that is. Uh, but Tom is still taking 0% of the wins. But you also notice that the population is about 50% satisfied. Um, that result was coming up when I was practicing this code. I wonder what happens if I put Sue and Deb up at the front. <clears throat> Okay, that does make that a little bit more even. Um, so there may be, if a candidate is tied on them, it's going to pick the one in, at, at, the, at the front of the list. Um, that'll be something to look at in a future uh, installment. Um, but the, although that is, I, if I recall correctly, I remember seeing a study a number of years ago that said that the order that candidates appear on a ballot actually does have some sort of impact on how people vote. Um, we, we will not incorporate that into this model because it's not Let's Code Psychology, although a Let's, although a Let's Code Psychology channel would be awesome. Um, is there a field of computational psychology? I need to go, I need to go find that out. I think that's called neuroscience, but I could be wrong. Um, <clears throat> anyway, again, the population is about 50% satisfied, so we've managed to distribute the votes a little bit better than we had last week but the overall satisfaction rating is still about 50%. Um, so having more viable candidates um, doesn't seem to be increasing our population satisfaction. But let's do take a look at what happens when we put Sue and Deb back to a more moderate stance. So let's suppose that they aren't quite to the extreme in the first dimension that Bob and Jim are, but they are to an extreme in the second dimension. As you might expect they, from, from last time, they end up taking less of the votes. And so Bob and Jim end up taking more of the votes. Uh, let's also take a look. What happens if we make Bob and Jim weaker on the second dimension? So in other words, Sue and Deb are weaker on the first dimension, whereas Bob and Jim are stronger on the, excuse me, Sue and Deb are weaker on the first dimension. Bob and Jim are stronger on the first dimension. Sue and Deb are stronger on the second dimension, while Bob and Jim are weaker on the second dimension. <clears throat> okay, uh, we got a little bit better, it looks like. Yeah, nobody won 50% of the time. Um, the population is still 50% happy, so so we can add candidates. It doesn't necessarily make the population more satisfied. Let's actually, uh, now that I've got more dimensions and more variety, I wonder if I need to increase the number of election cycles that we loop over. Okay, that did level them out a little bit more. Okay, so I think the issue they were getting earlier was that I didn't have a large enough sample size. So that's good to know. Um, let's then go back to... Okay, so with the with with their weightings sort of balanced like that, we do get a, a greater variety of wins or more more evenly distributed wins. Let's see what happens when we put these folks back to their extreme values. So I have one negative one, negative one, 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 negative one, negative one. Good. So now the code will take a little bit longer to run. Actually, it'll take twice as long to run because we're going over twice as many loops. Okay, yeah, these distribute a, a little bit better than before. But again, population satisfaction 50%, a standard deviation of still one and some change. Let's take a look at another scenario. 
Let's suppose we make Sue a moderate in one dimension, and let's leave Deb uh, strong in both dimensions. Bob strong in both dimensions, Jim strong in both dimensions. Um, so now we've got three extreme candidates, one slightly moderate candidate. So let's pay attention to Sue's number of wins here. So you notice that these folks win the lion's share. Sue wins a, a significantly smaller percent of the time. If we even decrease that down to 0 0.4, then Sue wins 7% of the time. <clears throat> so this already gives you an idea of how two-party systems form. Is Say you've got a field of candidates, uh, and then one of them is not quite to the extreme like the others are. They win less of the time. One of the candidates wins a significant portion of the time, this 46 here. If the next candidate is a little bit weaker, they get even fewer wins. And suddenly Jim here is winning. Uh, Jim, who is the uh, only other uh, negative in the second dimension candidate, wins more than half the time. And so what happens in people's minds, and what we'll model in a future video, is that um, these is that these folks start to look over at Sue and start to wonder if she's capable of beating Tom. And so then they begin to start voting more heavily, more heavily for Deb and Bob um, and leaving Sue in the dust. But you also notice in all of this, Tom still does not have a chance. Tom may as well not be in this running as somebody who is truly in the middle on both dimensions. Let's try expanding our number of dimensions to three. So now let's say that there are three sets of issues that voters are concerned about and that they've got them mostly uncorrelated. So a, a, a view, a set of views in, uh, in dimension one doesn't necessarily correlate with a set of views in dimension two. That doesn't necessarily correlate with a set of views in dimension three. Um, let's change the number of issues to 7, because 7 times 3 is 21. We had 20 issues before. 21 is approximately the same thing as 20. And now, let's bring in four more candidates, because we've got four more combinations now that we can have. So now we've got to look at all three dimensions. Oh, and let's put Sue back up to an extreme. So now we've got every possible combination of 1 and negative 1. For three, it for three dimensions, and actually, let's go ahead and leave out Tom since we we know by now he's not going to win. Sorry, Tom. Um, <clears throat> so this will take a little bit longer to run because we got more candidates now. And at this point, my graph is basically a mess that is much less useful than I thought it would be. I'll probably try to clean that up later. And uh, we get a. Again, we get a 50% satisfaction rating, and we get, I'm not entirely sure why the votes are not so evenly distributed, um, because Deb and Bob and Dan are winning 10 times more than the other folks, but there's nothing necessarily special about those leaning values, um, because our candidates, excuse me, our voters are selecting a random leaning here for each one. Um, let's see what happens if we increase the number of issues. It's possible we don't, I mean with seven issues it's possible we're not getting a large enough sample size on that. So let's turn that to 20. So let's say there are 60 issues that these voters and candidates are concerned about. Okay, our graph has tightened up a little bit here. Uh, population satisfaction is still about 50%. We still have this imbalance of winnings here. In fact, John even won 0% of the time. So I'll have to take a look at that, see if there's some sort of uh, bias that's creeping in on some of these combinations. Um, what I do notice is that it is the same three taking more of the votes every time. Okay, well, I will take a look at those just to make sure that uh, that we're counting everything correctly. Um, but what we've learned today is we can decorrelate the, the beliefs, excuse me, we can decorrelate the issues um, that distributes the winnings a little bit better. Uh, it still leaves our population only 50% uh, 
satisfy. It's looking like that might be the maximum that we can get. Um, next time we're going to take a look at the priority that we're assigning. So in all of this we haven't changed how the um, voters assign a priority to their issues. So this is still a random number between 0 and 1. Um, the issue with that being what if somebody generates all high priorities or what if somebody generates all low priorities. Um, you know, you, you can't necessarily have everything as being important or you can't necessarily have nothing as being important. So next time we're going to take a look at what happens when we uh, implement a, uh, an ordering of priorities in this section. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye bye. Uh, I was recording, right? Okay, good.